So, I want to back up just a little bit because I gave you kind of a, I, I was realizing driving home the other day, kind of a, a um, scattered background introduction. So I want to kind of give you maybe a less scattered but more brief background introduction to the old English period today. <coughs> Before we, we get into bead, and we'll hopefully not only get into bead, but um, finish the stuff with bead today, because we're supposed to be up to, yeah, all the bead, so we just do the wander on Tuesday. Um, not going to get into the prehistory. Second century Britain. Um, we know Christianity is in the island uh, because we know there is a Christian deacon who is persecuted, put to death. Okay, um, It's thought, the tradition of the church is that Christianity came to Britain in the first century. That is, decades after Christ's death. The, the kind of, I don't want to say tradition of the church, but the legendary tradition is that Joseph of Arimathea, okay, the one who you know took Christ's body down from the cross, came to Britain. Uh, if you go to Glastonbury, um, there's a whole tradition about Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea being there and all that kind of thing. We don't have to go into that. But you have Christianity in England, or in Britain, in the second century. And it's, it's doing pretty well. There are churches we know of that were um, built, that were around in the second, third century, um, etc. And, and not just in, you know, what we today think of in England, but also over in Wales. Okay? 449, 450, according to Bede, is when the Anglo-Saxon invasions begin. These are the invasions by the Angles and the Saxons of Jutes from the Danish peninsula for the most part. Okay? Um, it used to be thought that they just kind of sailed across the North Sea and landed in England. We now know that's not the case. What they did, if I had that map back up here, um, or there's a map in your book, they hopscotched along the northern coast of Europe, right? And just west of that Danish peninsula, on the northern coast of Europe, there are, there's an area called Frisia, with the Frisian Islands. People in my History and English language course are going to get to know more about this than they probably want to know. Um, because the closest Germanic language to English is Frisian. Old Frisian and Old English are mutually intelligible for the most part. And if you know Frisian, it's not hard to learn English. Similarly, English speakers don't have as difficult a time learning Frisian modern-day Frisian, spoken on those islands, um, as they do German. Why? German went through some other sound changes and stuff that Frisian didn't. I mean, so, so Frisian and, and English are the two uh, are closest together um, rather than two other languages. Okay? 597, Pope Gregory, Gregory the Great, the one from whom we get the you know, Gregorian chants, so to speak, sends a missionary to England or to Britain. And he does this, again, according to Bede, because when Gregory had not been a pope, but when he was, I think, a deacon. I think this is right. Um, one day he was visiting a slave market, and he spoke to this boy and girl, I think it was boy and girl, brothers and sisters, brother and sister, who were good looking, fair haired, blue eyed, I mean, the Nordic kind of um, goddess, so to speak. And he was speaking to them, and he asked, you know, who they were. I'm assuming he was speaking through a translator, either that or he knew uh, old English. Uh, and they told him that they were Angles from Anglaland, what today we call England. Okay? They were Angles. And he said, no, 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 because Gregory liked to make puns. No, 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 you're not Angles. You are Angelus, angels, because of how fair 
they were in appearance. And he found out that they were thoroughgoing rotten pagans. You know, they didn't know anything about Jesus. So he thought that was a shame that these angel-looking people, angelic-looking people, uh, shouldn't know anything about Christ. So he sends Augustine after he becomes Pope. Right? Augustine doesn't want to go. <laughs> Why? Because the Germans are known for being bloodthirsty Germans, or the Angles, if you will. But he does go. And beginning in 597, you begin to have the Roman Christianization, if you want to call it that, of, or the Roman re Christianization. Christian is, boy, that's a hard word to say. <laughs> Christianization of Britain. Okay? Remember, it had been Christian before, but the Anglo Saxons and the Jews come in. They're not. And what are they doing when they come in? Okay? The term I've used two or three times now is invasions. What do you do when you invade? Stamp out the ancestors. You wipe out and destroy. Yeah, I mean, you take it. Right? <coughs> Some modern historians no longer call these invasions. They call them migrations. Why? Because migration sounds much more peaceful. Can't we all just get along? We just want a little bit of land, farm, and work. That's not what they were doing. Because we know, archaeological evidence and such, that when the Germanic peoples came in, the people that were there did one of two things. They fought or fled. They didn't necessarily just hold out the big you know, welcome sign and allow them in. Okay, Where did they flee to? They fled... West to Wales, Cornwall, north to Scotland, or across the English, what we call today, the English Channel, to the part of France that still has as its name Little Britain. Britain. Where Breton is spoken, okay, which is a Celtic. <coughs> Um, kind of a Romano-Celtic, that is, partially Romance and Celtic language, right? So, from this period to about this period, Christianity gets not quite wiped out, but pretty strongly wiped out, okay? So there aren't many Christians still around. Now, between these two periods, when the um, after the initial waves, yeah, the Germanic people, they do start settling down and marrying in. And when they come, they're initially, when they come, they're asked to come. Why? you got to back up a little bit. 410 A.D. Rome is sacked. Rome, way Mediterranean. So, the emperor, emperor of the Western Empire, at that point, um, withdraws the Roman legions that have been spread out around the world, the known world at that point. It'd be like the United States, you know, withdrawing all of our forces, pulling 50,000 out of South Korea, pulling a couple hundred thousand out of Western Europe, pulling everybody out of the Middle East, pulling all of our Navy out of the various places it is, bring them all home, you know, Fortress America kind of thing. Well, they were essentially trying to do the same thing to Rome. So, the legions leave Britain. What is the nature of whore? A vacuum. And when the Roman legions leave, there's a huge sucking sound as they leave. And why are the legions there in the first place? Well, one, part of the annexation, part of Julius Caesar's conquering, and then, um, I can't remember the other one, uh, the one who annexes it. And then what? Well, if you go far enough far enough north in Britain, what today we call England, you'll eventually reach a big wall. Sound familiar? <laughs> it's called Hadrian's Wall. <coughs> Why did Hadrian build a wall in the second century? Why does Trump want to build a wall? To keep people out. To keep people out. Who did he want to keep out? The Scots and Picts. Why? You don't mess with the Picts. These are the guys, if you ever saw Mel Gibson's Braveheart, 
Great movie, historically just all wrong. <laughs> the Picts were the ones who fought naked, painted in blue, and would scare the bejeebies out of everybody they fought against, because they would come out of the misty woods screaming, blood-curdling yells, and then stark naked. And the Romans didn't like that. So the Romans <laughs> built a big wall to keep them out. They leave, and what do the Picts realize? We don't have to stay up here north in frozen Scotland. We can go farther south. And so they start to raid. So there's a, a Romano-Celtic chieftain, that, or excuse me, a Romano-British chieftain, that is, he is now of Roman and British stock. His ancestors intermarried a while back, named Vortigern. This guy comes, we know all this from Bede. Vortigern. He sends an emissary to the Germanic peoples. It's not like he sends an embassy or a, an ambassador to an embassy. They didn't have a single embassy. He just sends a few folks, and he says, help. We need help fighting the Scots and Picts. Why do they need help? Because the Romano-British people at this point, they're not warriors. What, what happens when you have somebody defending you all the time? You don't have to. You don't have to, and you don't know how to fight well for yourself. Right? So he hires a bunch of German mercenaries. Think if you're familiar with one of the Rocky films, Dolph Lundgren, cloned, seven foot physicist, so you know, brawny and brilliant at the same time, right? So he sends an emissary and he invites the Germans to come fight their battles. The Germans do. They kick you know what on the picks. But then the Germans also realize something. Well, the people who invited us over, they're a bunch of softies. <laughs> We can stay if we want. And so they start staying. They start doing a little pillaging and such. They conquer. But they intermarry also. So that by the time of Augustine, you, you don't have, quote, pure, what people like today think, want to think of as pure Celts. There aren't any pure Celts anywhere. You can go to the Hebrides Islands, the Orkney Islands. There ain't no pure Celts anywhere. Just like, sorry if you know, you're know one of these. There aren't any Druids. There aren't any real Druids. The last real Druid died in the 17th century. And everybody today who dr dresses up in white and goes to you know the summer solstice and goes to Stonehenge and dances and does weird things around Stonehenge, it's all made up. Okay, So, Augustine comes. In Roman Christianity is now gradually introduced, right? but it spreads quickly. It's thought that probably within a hundred years, almost all of Britain is now Christian. Now, bear in mind, this is 597. We're coming up about a month and a half from now, take that back, two months from now, we will celebrate what very famous beer drinking day. St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick has nothing to do with beer, but, you know, people want to drink green, green beer. When did St. Patrick live? Earlier than this, in Ireland. Okay. Ireland was still Christian because of Patrick, Columba, and those before them. Parts of northern Scotland were still Christian, even though the Germanic tribes had come. Why? They didn't go up into the highlands. They were that smart. <laughs> you don't go up where guys are hiding behind trees dressed all in blue, you know, and they pop out. And... So, you know, you had the Isle of Skye, the Isle of Iona, which were holy isles. Off the west coast of, of Ireland, you have the island of Skellig, which is where Luke Skywalker goes to. It's a holy island, okay? It was founded by Irish monks and such. All that stayed. So there were still all those Christians. So when Augustine comes, he's bringing Roman Christianity, but there are monks and such from northern Scotland who are also coming down into northern England, bringing Celtic Christianity, and the two kind of meet and butt heads, and there's a problem, which 
we may not talk about it at all. Um, Cadman. Notice this is only 80 some years later. 680, Bede, tells us the story of St. Cadman. Not St. Cadman, Cadman. And we'll talk about Cadman um, more in a moment. Right? 731, Bede writes, publishes per se, what's called the Ecclesiastical History of the English-Speaking Peoples. Big long title just means Church History of the English People. Okay? And it's exactly what it sounds like. It is a church history, but it gives us a little history of before the church. He gives us the history of the founding of England, or Britain if you want. Britain, the name Brit comes from Brute, right? which is the shortened form of Brutus, not Brutus of, you know, Julius Caesar Brutus, but Brutus, the descendant, grandson, I believe, of Aeneas of Troy. The Brits, according to their national mythology, are really Trojans. Now, how cool is that? It'd be really cool if they won. <laughs> but, you know, who wants to be the descendants of the losers? Because uh, that's kind of what they were. Anyways, B writes Ecclesiastical History of the English-Speaking People, where he gives kind of the, the foundational history of the English people and the church okay, in England. He writes a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Bede is, is what today would be called a polymath. The guy can do everything. He can do math, for example. He can do math really, really well. He does music. He does philosophy. He does astronomy. He does science. He writes multiple books on all of those topics, as well as being a biblical exegete. He writes exegesis, commentary on passages of the Bible, and he even translates a bit of it. Okay? But he dies, 735. Now, this period, Late 7th century, early 8th century. What is that kind of commonly called? Louder, Emma. The Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. And yet, if you open your book, if it's not already open, shame on you. If you open your book, you will see, for example, this. This is the Sun Who gold belt buckle. Okay? This is a belt buckle that was discovered in 1939 or 1938 in England in a big mound of dirt. It wasn't the only thing found in the big mound of dirt. When I say big mound of dirt, that mound was about 50 feet tall and about 100 feet in diameter. Big. <laughs> Why was there a big mound of dirt? Because at this place where this big mound of dirt is, there are about 30 other big mounds of dirt. Not all of them the same size, but this one had a boat buried in it. A hundred foot long, think of that. About a 90 foot long boat. And it was about 20, 28 feet wide. The nearest body of water is two miles away, downhill. <laughs> So when they buried this boat, they rode it up the River Devon, and then they pulled it uphill. They didn't dig a big hole and put it in and then put the dirt on top. They had flat ground, they put the boat, and then they dug a big hole somewhere else and got the dirt and buried it. Okay? This was one of the things found there during the height of the Dark Ages. If you look at that very, very closely, you'll see little black dots. Those little black dots, it's not like dirt. Each of those little black dots is a piece of inlaid stone. Each one of them. We cannot, we don't have a metalsmith today who can reproduce this. Okay? Dark ages. You turn the page. I think it's the next page. Yeah. You have the Cairo page from the Lindisfarne Gospels. Okay? Roughly 698. Get online, type in carpet page, Lindisfarne Gospels, and you will see the most amazing maze you will ever see. 
and you can, if you have the patience, kind of like take a thread, so to speak, a line in that illustration or illumination, and you can follow it. It'll take you hours to follow it all everywhere it goes. Okay? That's part of the Dark Ages. So who called it the Dark Ages? Who's the bright person who came up with that? Notice the little pun there. <laughs> Scholars in the Renaissance. What does Renaissance mean? Nice fancy French word for rebirth. Rebirth of what? Classical learning. That is, everybody between the ancient Greeks and Romans and us were morons. <laughs> they lived in a dark period of intellectual development. Why? Because they didn't know Plato, Socrates. You know, think Princess Bride and Fazzini when he says, you know, Socrates, Plato, Eric, morons, all of them. That's what kind of the Renaissance scholars said about the people who came in the, they also came up with the phrase Middle Ages. Because if you're in the Middle Age, it's kind of like, eh, it's not really all that important. The First Age is important, and the age you're in now is important. Okay? So, B dies, height of that period. 793 or variously dated. In Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it's dated 787. In 787, the Vikings are first seen. You get this really, really cryptic passage in the Anglo-Saxon, one of the versions of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for the year 787. And all it says is, in this year, three longboats were seen. Hmm. It's kind of like somebody is standing up on a cliff, looking out in the North Sea, and goes, Hmm. Three longboats. Longboats means long boats. But they don't land. But the Viking invasions begin in 793. Okay. Coming from Norway and Denmark primarily, as I said. And what do they do? They start ravaging, pillaging, etc. Where do they hit first and foremost? Churches. Why? That's where all the gold is. Because priests are dirty, rotten capitalists? No. If this is a Bible, and this is, according to your ideology, the very word of God, and how important does that become? Really important. So do you just cover it in a piece of crappy paper? No. You surround it with gold and gemstones. Why? Because you're filthy rich? Nope. To accord the value of what's inside. And so when somebody comes up for the Eucharist in your church, in your monastery, do you hold out to them a plastic cup with wine in it? If they had plastic. No, you don't. What do you have? You have a wooden cup? Silver or gold. And not just gold, but gold encrusted with gems. And if you have a cross... For somebody to venerate or revere or kiss, is it just a cross made out of wood? Nope, it's made out of gold. Why? To show your veneration for what the cross stands for, etc., etc. Vikings, they don't give a rat you know what for what it represents. All they think of is moolah. It's shiny. It's shiny, yeah. Ooh, bling. bling. It's, it's bling for them. So they... Rob in melt. Okay? And if you get in their way, they kill you. And maybe even if you don't get in their way, they kill you anyways. Because that's what the Vikings did for fun. Believe me, we've got all kinds of source material about the Vikings, and they were not nice people by any, uh, any means. Okay? So that begins then. About 100 years later, Alfred becomes king. We're trying to do this quickly. Alfred should never be king. Why? He's the youngest of five boys. So, eldest brother, next eldest, next eldest. One of those next eldest was uh, mentally challenged, so you know, leave him aside. Uh, one died relatively young in youth, I think, so leave him aside. Uh, one or two did become king, but anyways, Alfred becomes king. Okay? And doesn't have such a great time to begin with. But in 878, 
He defeats a guy named Guthrum the Dane. Okay? And it's a total defeat for Guthrum. And it's a massive, huge victory for Alfred. And it's so massively huge because he is outnumbered. His troops are outnumbered. I think the, the number was something like 12 to 1. And Alfred defeats him. He defeats him so badly that on what's called the Treaty of Wedmore, we don't know where Wedmore is. We don't know where the actual battle occurred. It's written about, but we don't know where that location is, even though the location is named in the materials. It's between now and then, you know, places change now and then. Alfred forces Guthrum to agree on a couple of, you know, couple of things. One, you gotta become a Christian. You gotta stop being a filthy rags and pagan. Okay? Become a Christian. And I, Alfred, will be your godfather. This isn't like not that kind of godfather. Okay? This is good old traditional godfather. I will help train you up in the faith. I will make sure you become the best Christian you ought to become. Because Alfred was really, really um, religious. If you watch The Last Kingdom, one of you mentioned that your mom. If you watch The Last Kingdom on Netflix, which is based on the Bernard Cornwall novels about a guy named Uhtred of Bebenburg, not a historical character, almost everybody else is in the, in the um, stories. Novels are really, really good. The Netflix series, not so good. Um, because the Netflix series makes Alvarez into this simpering, conniving. And he may have been, but we don't know that, okay? Um... He also forces the Danes to move out of where they've, part of where they've been living in England. Um, if we had a map up here, we could draw a line essentially from London, down here in kind of the southeast, up to about Chester, okay, in the northwest of Midlands. And everything south and west of that would be ruled by the English or English law. Everything north and east of that became what is called the Dane law. That is, it's where Danish law held sway. That is, pagan Vikings. Okay? Even though Guthrum became a Christian. And from what all the sources tell us, he seriously really did. He never... Oh, shut up, Siri. <laughs> he never attacked the English again. Okay? But if you go to England today and you go to that area, north and east kind of of that line, you find tons of places that have Viking names to them or the ends of Viking names. Kind of like It's Viking. Okay. Word that ends, or if your last name is, Thorpe. That's Viking. Or Thwait. Sometimes with an E, sometimes not. That's Viking. Or B. That's Viking. B just means homestead of. So there's a town on the coast of England called Grimsby. That's where Grim lived. There's a town called Whitby. That's where Wit was, though Wit is a Christian term. It's not the name of a person. Okay? Murfreesboro. This is the borough, the burg. Martin Luther wrote a hymn. Um, Ein Festeburg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is my God. Burg. That's where borough comes from. Fortress. This is the fortress of Murphy. I don't know how fortressy it is. Okay? So, Alfred dies, 899. Son becomes king, grandson becomes king after that, etc., etc. Let's jump a few years to the Battle of Malden, 991. Alvared that I mentioned the other day, Alvared the Unrad is king, and the Vikings are kind of periodically attacking. But Alvared uh, is paying tribute to them. Protection money, that's what it is. It's a mafia racket. Okay? I'll pay you, don't attack us. He paid, they still attacked. So, there's a town called 
Malden, a place called Malden, in um, East Anglia. And these Vikings came, and there was this old alderman, leader of the place, named Birtnoff. And the Vikings come, and Birtnoff's like, no, I'm not going to contribute. We're going to keep you, sorry, <laughs> out of here. And according to what we know, i got to erase all this, there is a river called the Pant. Flows like this. And in the middle of the river, there's kind of an island. And at low tide, it's a tidal river. At low tide, you can cross over from this part of the land to the island. High tide, you can't. Low tide, you can walk pretty much just one person across at a time, single file. And according to the poem, The Battle of Malden, Beardnoth gets a wild hair of kind of a much later medieval idea of noblesse oblige. I'm going to allow the Vikings to come across. Why? Because we're English. And we'll kill them. Even though they're wildly outnumbered. And so he allows them to come across. And the English get slaughtered. <laughs> Just totally slaughtered. Every last... Except for those who flee. The cowards. And they're named. <laughs> I mean, the poet names them. And it's kind of like, you and your children and your grandchildren and their children... Yeah, we're going to remember you. you know. But we get this great, great, great poem about it. And the poem expresses this great heroic attitude. We'll talk about that um, a little bit later. But it's a huge loss. 1014, 1016, we talked about it the other day. Svein Forkbeard and his son Knut invade. Alderaid flees. Svein temporarily becomes king. He dies. His son becomes king. Jump to 1066, which we talked about. The only thing about here I didn't talk about, um, we talked about January 5th, Edward the Confessor dies. January 6th, Harold Godwinson is named king. January, uh, excuse me, September 25th, Battle of Stamford Bridge, up in Yorkshire, okay? Harold Godwinson has to march to Yorkshire, raise an army, defeats his brother, Harold Hardrada. Word reaches him, William of Normandy has landed on the southern coast, and so now he's got to march south. October 14th, 1066, you get the Battle of what's called Hastings. Why? Because Hastings is the nearest town. The actual battle occurred about five miles outside of Hastings in the town that is today called Battle. <laughs> but we don't call it the Battle of Battle because the town wasn't there at the time. The town grew up afterwards and was given the name Battle. According to the bio tapestry, that big long piece of fabric that I talked about, Harold Godwinson dies from an arrow in the eye. Apparently, someone says, look! <laughs> <laughs> and where he dies, William the Conqueror has an abbey built. He has an abbey built over the spot of the battle, and where William, excuse me, where Harold apparently died, that is the exact site, according to the records, of the altar. So that every time Mass is said, it is said on the bones, over the bones of Harold Godwinson. In a traditional um, Christian church from the earliest times forward, wherever you have a quote-unquote altar, wherever you have a real church, there have to be relics of a saint there. Okay. Um, 1225, same year, William is crowned King of England. Why does he do it on Christmas Day? Who else was famously crowned on Christmas Day? Anybody know? Charlemagne. What does Charlemagne, the name, mean? Charles the Great. How did Charles the Great get, count, get crowned? Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day. He handed the crown to the Pope and said, give it back. <laughs> he handed the crown to the Pope and said, put it on me. Sure, <laughs> by all means. By the way, the Holy Roman Empire, with beginning with Charlemagne, that was the second Roman Empire, right? First Roman Empire begins a lot earlier. What was the third? The Third Reich. 
That's what Hitler had in mind. Not so holy, but you know, the Third Reich, right? So that's the the Anglo-Saxon period in a nutshell. Ten twenty. Not going too bad. All right, let's um, let's pick up with Bede, and I want to pick up Bede with. Page forty-seven, and some we're gonna we're gonna skim over some of this stuff. Okay. Right? Bede is recounting, is telling us about King Edwin, King of Northumbria, the and the faith of the um, East Angles. Okay, Northumbria. That's where Bede was from. That's where Cadman was from. So when I said, you know, this is the, the kind of the height of the so-called Dark Ages, well, Northumbria, during the quote-unquote Dark Ages, would be like culturally, what in the world today? What is a cultural capital in the world today? New York City. New York City. Where else? Louder? L.A.? Eh, depends on what kind of culture you're talking. Um, I mean, if you're talking about film, yeah, probably. Yeah. Paris, Milan, London, Northumbria was all of that. Why? Because what was going on in Paris? Nothing. <laughs> What's going on in Rome or in London? Nothing. Rome? Rome was in shambles. Rome had been overridden by the barbarians. I mean, it was literally in shambles, right? London was nothing but a Stinking pigsty, essentially. But it's in Northumbria that you have the Lindisfarne Gospels being produced. You've got the Book of Kells being produced. You've got the Durham Gospels being produced. Right? You've got some classical learning being transmitted. In fact, when Charlemagne is looking for someone to be the headmaster of the school in Aachen, Germany, for his children... He doesn't look to London, he doesn't look to Paris, he doesn't look to Rome, he doesn't look to Cologne, he doesn't look to Berlin. He looks to York, and he hires an Englishman named Alcuin to come over and teach. Okay. So, B begins for us, and this is, this is not early in the book, I mean this is just a little snippet. But he's beginning for us at least with Edwin, king of the Angles. Now, when Augustine came, he didn't come first to Edwin. He went to Kent. Right? And the first king that he met, the king was pagan. Train of thought, trying to complete blank on his name. The king was pagan, but his wife was Christian. His wife wasn't English. His wife was French or Gaulish, if you like. Okay? Um, but we're starting with Edwin. Why? Because of a dream that Edwin had. That then gets fulfilled, according to Bede. So page 47. Edwin is told that another one of the kings wants to kill him. So he flees. He goes to Radwald of East Anglia. Radwald, by the way, may be the person, if there was a body buried at Sutton Hoo, it was probably Radwald. So it wasn't a body, then we think, most scholars think, Sutton Hoo was probably created to commemorate Radwald. That is, something happened to his body, but they built a big old, essentially, a mausoleum anyways. Right? So he goes, he runs off to Radwald. Radwald, you know, offers him protection and stuff. And he remains there for a while. And we're told, bottom of page 47, right-hand column, at one night, suddenly, in the middle of the night, a man approaches him, who doesn't look like he's from these parts. More than a little frightened at this unexpected sight, the stranger came close, saluted him, asked why he sat there. Edwin told him what was going on. The stranger says, I know what's going on. I know who you are, why you grieve, the evils which you fear will fall upon you. What would you give the person who could free you from this anguish? 
and persuade Radwald neither to harm you himself nor to give you up to your enemies. Because Edwin thinks Radwald's either going to kill him, why, to ingratiate himself with this other king, or he's going to hand him over to the other king. He says, uh, what, what would I give that person? And the other guy keeps talking. What if he also assured you that you will overcome your enemies and be a king who surpasses in power not only all your ancestors, but also all who have reigned before you over the English? So you'll not only live, but you'll be the most powerful king who's ever ruled among the English. Sound good? Sound like, do we have a deal here, Edwin? Edwin says, uh, yeah, I, I give you whatever you want. Okay. So if the one who truly foretold so many good things could also give you better and more useful life for your life and salvation, and at that point, everyone's probably going, salvation, what is that? <laughs> I, I don't know that word. It, better than any of your other ancestors or kindred ever heard of, would you consent to obey him and to follow the saving counsel? Yeah, sure, okay. I mean, he's probably still thinking, king, power. <laughs> Whatever you say. So, the other person, the stranger, says, all right. He puts his hand on Edwin's head. When this sign shall come to you, remember this conversation that has passed, and do not hesitate to fulfill what you have promised. So, when someone comes up to you and puts his hand on your head, remember. Kind of like Mufasa saying to Simba, remember who you Remember this. Okay? So he sits there alone for a while. And we have, skipping a bit, um, page, uh, page 48, right hand column. Paulinus comes. And Edwin hesitates to accept the word of God preached by Paulinus. Now we don't know how Paulinus is preaching it. Paulinus might be saying, you're all dirty, rotten, SOB Germans, descendants, and you deserve to rot in hell. But I'm going to offer you grace in Jesus. Turn or burn. Are you really going to encourage them to turn? Probably not. So, one day the man of God, Paulinus, comes to Edwin, puts his right hand on his head. Okay, keep in mind, who's Edwin? King. king. Does anybody just walk up and touch the king? No. I mean, there was a big hullabaloo when the Obamas first went and visited um, life <coughs> as president and first lady. Why? Because Michelle Obama touched Queen Elizabeth. I mean, this is 2014 or so. Okay, get over it, folks. But she touched her. She put her hand like on her elbow as they were walking and uh, I mean the protocol police all just went bananas over that okay he puts his hand on the king and says the king was about to fall down why because he remembers behold with God's help you have escaped the hands of the enemies you feared behold you have obtained by his gift the kingdom you desired take heed not to delay what you promised to do. And he's kind of like, I told you. <laughs> Behold, you have um, received the faith, keep the commandments of him who rescued you from earthly adversity and has raised you to the honor of an earthly kingdom. If from this time forward, you're willing to follow his will, which is made known to you through me, which I will tell you what his will is. He will not only deliver you from the everlasting torments of the wicked, hell, but also make you a partaker with him of his eternal kingdom in the heaven. Okay? Now, let me back up for a moment. Because I need to talk about something I haven't discussed. We've talked about how the Germanic peoples, if you go back to 449, 450, were pagan. What does that mean? What did the Germanic tribes believe in? They didn't believe in nothing. They believed in something. So what they believe in? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay. Or specifically, Tyr, Tyr, Woden, Thor, Frey, Freya, the Germanic pantheon. Odin, 
Okay? They believed in all those gods. So what does that mean? How many of you saw... I shouldn't ask this because it's a stupid question, but I will anyway. How many of you saw Thor Ragnarok? Anybody? A few of you did. Okay, forget all that. Because <laughs> that's not what Ragnarok is all about. In Germanic mythology, what happens at Ragnarok? Ragnarok gets translated into a different term by Richard Wagner in his Ring of the Nibelungen cycle. Okay, He gives it the term the Gutter Damarung, the Twilight of the God. Because here's what happens at Ragnarok. Let me back up. Who's the bad guy in German mythology? Who's the bad guy in Thor? Loki. Always. Loki. Yeah, I know how it comes into it. It's Loki. Why? What's Loki? God of mischief. He's the god of mischief. He's the trickster god. Okay? So, if you read Germanic myth, and some of it's so cool because of the stuff Loki gets people up to. I mean... Gets Thor in a cross dress and you know <laughs> marries a man and all kinds of weird stuff goes on. Okay, um, here's what happens in Germanic mythology: you've got Fenris Ulf. Okay, you have the Midgard serpent. Yeah, you've got Cert and you've got Hela, and we're going to leave Cert and Hela um, out for right now. But you've got Fenris Ulf in the Midgard server. Who's Fenris Ulf? Big giant wolf. Okay. Uh, if you've read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, who is the wolf who serves the White Queen? Fenris. Okay. What's the Midgard serpent? It's this big giant snake that encircles the world, sleeping at the bottom of the ocean. And at Ragnarok, a couple of things are going to happen. See, Fenris Ulf is chained. He's chained up. How did he get chained? Because the god Tyr tricked him, got close enough to him, and swore and promised that he wasn't going to bind him. And he swore, promised, by putting his hand in Fenris' mouth. And when he did, he threw a magical chain around him that Fenris could not break. And when Fenris, when he did that, Fenris bit his hand off. Okay? This is why we have Tears Day today. We still use Tuesday. Okay? So Fenris Ulf is bound. Bound with this mighty chain. The Midgard Serpent is bound also. And there's a prophecy that when Baldur dies, okay, Baldur is one of two brother gods. There's a whole bunch of sibling gods. But one of two brother gods. That when Baldur dies, that will trigger the beginning of Ragnarok. How so? Because Loki will then flee Asgard, dwelling of the gods, and he will go off and he will free Fenris Ulf. And Fenris Ulf will then free the Midgard Serpent. And they will bind together, they will join together with the Frost Giants and Dwarves and Orcs, Orkneas, and Ilvas, Elves, and all the other creatures of chaos and launch an almighty cataclysmic war against Asgard. And Humanity. So you can have these, Loki, okay, the Frost Giants, and all the forces of chaos take on Thor, Odin, Tyr, Frigg, Freya, all the other gods, all the human heroes, in Wagner's version, Siegfried, in the Old English, we'll see in Beowulf, Sigamund. In all the guys who have died, all the heroes who have died in battle. Because when they die in battle, where do they go? They don't just drift off into the ether. 
they go to Valhalla, which means what? Hall of the Val. Val, Old English, W-A-E-L, which means slaughter. The Hall of the Dead. All those who died in battle, which is why it's really important. If you're a soldier, if you're a warrior, and you are in battle, and you get disarmed, and when you die, for your enemy, a good enemy will do this, will put your sword back in your hand so that you can die gripping your sword. Why? Because if you don't die with your sword in your hand, you don't go to hell. You go to hell. And hell isn't a place of eternal fire and damnation. Hell is just really cold. It's an ugly day like this. About... 28, 25 degrees, and you don't have fur. And all you do is, there's nothing to do. <laughs> Until the end of time. Okay? So, at Ragnarok, all the forces of evil or chaos line up against all the forces of quote-unquote good. We can debate as to how good Odin and Thor and you know, the others are. But that includes living heroes and warriors, as well as the dead. Because from Valhalla come all the souls of the dead warriors, and they get a fight too. And guess who wins? Chaos. Loki, Fenris Ulf, the Midgard Serpent, the Frost Giants, they win. Chaos reigns supreme. So what kind of future does that give you to look forward to? I don't mean future like tomorrow. I mean future long term. What has Paulinus just promised Edward? You can, how does he put it? He will make you a partaker with him of his eternal kingdom in heaven. Eternal means what? Outside time. No in. Okay. This lights are out, folks. Leave the door. <laughs> or close the door when you leave because there's nothing left. Okay? So Germanic mythology, there's there's nothing to look forward to in the afterlife, really. Ultimately. Yeah, you might party for a while with Brunhild and the other Valkyries. Valkyries, those who bring the dead to Valhalla. You might party for a while, but at the in the ultimate end, there is no future. By the way, Germanic is, I think it's one of only two languages. I think Hittite is the other one. Um, it's one of the only languages in all the Indo-European languages that doesn't have a future tense. How do we make the future in English? Do we add a, an ending on a word? We add a, what's called a modal auxiliary. We have to add another verb. In Latin, nope. You just add a different ending onto the verb, and it indicates futurity. Greek does the same. Sanskrit does the same. Russian does the same. All the Romantic, uh, Romance languages do that. All the Celtic languages do that. I think Hittite, which is one of the earliest known of the Indo-European languages, is the only other one that doesn't have a true future tense. And some scholars, 150 years ago, suggested that might be because the Germanic people did not see any future. Hmm. I mean, everything is right here or yesterday. And that gives you the emphasis on fame, glory, because this is all you get. Okay? So, the king hears the words of Paulinus, and what does he do? He says, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. Cool, that's good for me. But he's not willing to accept it for all of his people. Okay. He says, i got to talk about it with my chief men and counselors. Well, who does chief men and counselors include? His priests. Okay. His pagan priests. One of them is named. In fact, not just one of them, the chief of them. This would be like the Supreme Court Justice, 
or the Chief Justice, Coifey. Coifey responds to Edwin and says, you know, let's just pause here and think about this, O King. The religion we practiced until now has no virtue in it. Virtue doesn't mean nice little piety thing. He means power. The religion we practice up until now is worthless, is what he's saying. And he's who? Chief priest. He's the Pope. This is the Pope saying, Christianity is a sham. It doesn't work. Look at what he says. None of your people has devoted himself more diligently to the worship of our gods than me. In other words, I do everything our religion requires. And what do I get from it? And yet there are many who receive greater favors and greater honor from you than I do and are more prosperous in all their undertakings. Now what has he just said to the king? He's just slapped him verbally. I follow our religious laws the best. And there are all kinds of other people that you show a whole lot more favor to. That's his way of saying, oh, man, you've been cheating me out all this time. You give, you know, Fred over there, who's a lousy piece of slime, more honor, more glory, more good <laughs> stuff than you do to me. If the gods, you know, I mean, this is good logic, right? <laughs> if the gods had any power, I'd get more. This is like the Pope saying, if Jesus was real, I'd have more. I, mean, I don't know that you can say that because the Pope pretty much has everything. If the gods had any power, they would have helped me more readily since I have been more careful to serve them. It follows, therefore, in other words, the conclusion is, if on examination these new doctrines which are now preached to us are found to be better and more effective, we should accept them immediately and without delay. What's he mean? Found to be better and more effective. It's almost like he's an American. Do they work? Do, will it put money in my bank? I mean, if Jesus is real, I should be wealthy. Or I should be healthy. Or I should have a nice car. It's that kind of mentality he's approaching it from. All right? Another one of the king's chief men kind of goes, let me, let me add something here. He says, let's think about it this way. In other words, let's not go all mercenary like Coifi is. Let's not just think of it as the bottom line. How much money will this new religion result in my bank account? And he says, I think life's like this. Here's a hall. A hall has a window in it at one end, and it's got a window, window in it at the other end. And he says, The present life of man, O king, seems to be in comparison with that time which is unknown to us. If you are sitting in your feasting hall with your aldermen and thanes in wintertime, with a good fire burning in the middle of the hall, and all inside is warm, while outside the winter storms of rain and snow are raging. And a sparrow flies swiftly through the hall, entering in at one door and quickly flying out at another. While he is within, the winter storms cannot touch him. But after the briefest moment of calm, he immediately vanishes out of your sight, out of the winter, and back into it again. So this life of man appears just for a moment. What is our life like? It's like this brief moment of time that the sparrow is where? Warm. What's the sparrow experiencing here? Whatever's coming on outside here, because while we're inside here, we don't know what's outside here. So what's this? This is birth. And this is death. Notice, we don't know where we come from. And we don't know where we're going. But while we're here, it's not so bad. What do we try to do? Let's add on to the house. <laughs> Let's make the house that much bigger. The only problem is, we can't add it on to it infinitely. So, so this life of man appears just for a moment of what went before, or what is to follow, we know nothing at all. 
if this new doctrine contains anything more certain, we should follow it. That is, if our understanding of this is zero, and our understanding of this is zero, then if, if this new doctrine gives us a one, I say we follow it. And if it gives us a one over here, I say we follow it. What's he really saying? What kind of logic is this other chief um, men, man saying? We don't know anything based off what we have. This offers us literally anything that's worth a shot. That's it. It offers us more than what we have. But notice how he does it. What does he what does he said here? What has he created for us? Visual. What kind of visual? He told us a story. What's he, what's he mean? This story? It's a better story than the other story we have, right? Take a red rock. <laughs> Not a good ending to that story. The Christian story? Reign with God forever in heaven. That's a pretty good ending. Now, it's contingent upon some things, right? You know, Doing what he, Paulinus, tells them to do. Why? Because Paulinus says, I will express to you the will of God. So, following, you know, certain rules, etc., etc. But in the Germanic system, what's Quaifi said? You screwed no matter what. Because <laughs> look at me. I've been following the laws. What have I got? Zilch. It's completely powerless. Two competing stories. Okay? Pretty interesting, I think at least, how story gets imbued with so much meaning. So, we go on. Edwin, his people become king, uh, become Christian. Christianity spreads through the island. Jump up to page 51. We've got 20 minutes, um, to the section Abbas Hild of Whitby and the miraculous poet Cadman. Now, Hild had been a princess. She was the daughter of a king. She gave it all up. Okay. In her 33rd year, Bede will tell us, she spent her, third, her first 33 years living most nobly in the secular habit. That is, not as a nun. But in her 33rd year, she dedicates her life to Christ. She becomes a nun. And then she becomes an abbess. That is, she is in charge of a monastery. Not convent. Monastery. She's ordering men around. Okay. Monks. And servants of the monastery and such. Such as Cadman. Because Cadman is not a monk. Okay. So we hear about, you know, Hild and such, and we read a lot about her and her death and such, and we're told, bottom of page 53, I'm skipping over the rest of Hild, Th this entire chapter in Bede, um, the uh, Bede's ecclesiastical history is divided into books, and then each book is divided into chapters. The entire chapter before Cadman, or that includes Cadman, is all about Abbas Hild. Okay. All. And then we get to this part about Cadman. And we read, in her monastery, there was this guy who used to make pious and religious verses so that whatever he learned from Holy Scriptures through interpreters, he soon afterwards turned into poetry. Why through interpreters? Um, the Bible wasn't in English. The Bible wasn't in English. Why else? It was only Latin. He couldn't read. He was illiterate. We're going to find out he's a cowherd. He herds cows for a living, for the monastery. Okay? He goes to work at the monastery kind of late in life. So, he had lived in the secular life until he was well, this is page 54, left-hand column, until he was well advanced in years. He had never learned any verses. 
that is, he'd never learned any English slash Germanic poetry. Therefore, sometimes at feast, when it was agreed for the sake of entertainment that all present should take a turn singing, when he saw the harp coming towards him, he would rise up from the table in the middle of the feast and go out. So notice what Bede's telling us here. It was the custom in the monastery, at the refectory table, as people are eating, as the monks are eating, for really two things to happen. One of them is stated explicitly, one of them is implied. One, they're drinking beer. Because the word that Bede uses is beershiba, for what gets translated as fellowship. So they're having a cater inside the monastery, all right? So the, the booze is flowing, and while the booze is flowing, somebody pulls out of a bag a harp. The harp probably looks like this. Okay. And it's got multiple strings here. And it's got a board here. This is hollowed out. It's got a piece of wood, but it's been hollowed out. And they don't play it like they play, you know, not like some angel sitting on a cloud kind of thing. And it's, it just accentuates the meter. Okay. So the harp comes around. Cadman sees the harp coming towards him, and he skedaddles out of there. Why? He can't sing. It doesn't mean he can't carry a tune. It doesn't mean he doesn't have a good voice. It means he doesn't know how to create a song. This stuff that we'll talk about, hopefully, today. So, Cadman gets up and leaves one night. He goes off, he goes, checks on the cows, and he falls asleep in the stable. And while he's out there and asleep, somebody wakes him up. Cadman, sing me something. Can't sing, man. That's why I left. <laughs> Came here, couldn't sing. The man says, nevertheless, you must sing to me. Okay. <laughs> what do you want me to sing about? What shall I sing? Sing about the beginning of created things. Notice, sing about creation. It's important. Most students think he's singing about God. Why? Because God's the creator. God's the one behind all created things. So this is what he sings. Nu shulen, this is on page 55. Part of it's up here. Nu shulen harayan havan reaches weird. Meh torez makta anders modyathank. Werk wilder fadders wahi wungre yohlas. Eich adrichten or estelda. He erst shop yelde bernum. He avant hochrova. Highly ship him. Thaw minyard monkin is wired, H. Adrichten after Theoda, Firm Folden, Freya Almiti. That's what he sings. Okay? But that's in Old English. Okay? That's the language Cadman would have spoken. When Bede writes it, he writes it in Latin. Because he's writing in Latin. The entire book that he writes is in Latin. So, Bede tells us. A translation. He says, the general sense of what Cadman's saying is this. We ought now to praise the maker of this heavenly kingdom, or of the heavenly kingdom, the power of the creator, his counsel, the deeds of the father of glory, and how he, since he is the eternal God, was the author of all marvels, and first as almighty guardian of the human race, created heaven as a roof for the sons of men, and then the earth. And then Bede tells us. This is the sense, but not the actual order of the words he sang in his sleep. Why? Because poetry, no matter how well composed, cannot be literally translated from one language into another without losing much of its dignity, uh, its beauty and dignity. Bede is telling us there, you want to be an English major and a French minor and you want to read French poetry? Learn French. You want to read Latin poetry? Learn Latin. You want to read Old English poetry? Learn Old English. Why? It's the only way you enter into the mind of the original authors of that language. Because what do you do every time you translate? Every translation is an act of interpretation. 
you've got a mass of words, right? Parian. We don't have Parian in modern English at all. It's dead. It's gone. How does it get translated? Praise. Can we come up with another word? Sure, we probably could. Adulate for a Latin form. Now shall we adulate. How about heaven reach us? Yeah, we have a form of that. Heaven. Heaven. Reach us. Reich. Kingdom. Word. Ward. Guard. Myth totus. Totally gone. Doesn't exist anymore in the English language. It means measure. But this one we still have. We spell it a little bit differently. Mecca, light. On his mode yathok. Mode, we have that survived today in the word. Mode yathok, totally gone. Let's not think. The things. The thonk here is in Tolkien's or thing. Okay? Work, work, wulder, fatter. Wulder, totally gone. It means glory. Better? Mother? Okay. So, Bede says, I'm giving you the gist of it, but I'm not giving you the real thing. Why? Probably because Bede wasn't there. Bede did not hear the literal words. But even if he was, he's writing in Latin. He's not writing in Old English. Now, one of the things we know that happens pretty quickly after Bede writes this is it gets translated back into Old English. But it doesn't necessarily get translated back exactly into the very same words Cadman gave. Because we have it translated into different dialects of Old English. There's how many copies? There's like six copies showing variation in word choice and such. Okay? So, Cadman wakes up and he remembers what happened. And what you do in the morning, he goes to the steward of the monastery. And he tells the steward what happened. The steward's like, well, I don't know, this is kind of shaky. I mean, funny men coming in the middle of the night telling me to sing songs. We better go talk to Hild. So they go talk to Hild. And Hild, being the good abbess that she is, realizes, I've got I to gotta find out if this is real. Why? Because John the theologian, John the beloved, the disciple of Christ, says in one of his epistles, test the spirits. See whether they are from God or not. If they say Jesus is the Christ and rose from the dead, then you can trust them. If they don't, don't believe them. So we're going to test whether or not the spirit was really from Christ. How? Get together with a couple priests. They're going to tell you some Bible stories. Come back tomorrow. And they turn those stories into poetry. How's that for a final exam? Because <laughs> it's like, and if you don't, Satanic visitations, probably not good. Okay. So he goes off with the priests. He comes back the next day, and he retells the stories he was told in beautiful poetry. Okay. Why is all this important? Because this is the beginning of English poetry as we know it. This is the first English poet. Okay. So here's what Cadman couldn't do before... He has his nightly visitation. And after his nightly visitation, he can do this. Now, these are the so-called rules of alliterative verse, if you want to put it that way. This, these seven points, this applies to all Germanic poetry from the beginning up to the early Middle Ages. Okay. How do we know? Because these rules are based upon analysis of all Germanic poetry, and they all do this. It's not that somebody back in 1100 said, here are the rules for writing Germanic alliterative poetry. <laughs> it's that people deduced all these from reading all that poetry. So Beowulf does this. The Dream of the Rood does this. The Wanderer and the Seafarer that we're going to read do this. The Icelandic sagas that have poetry, they all do this. Okay? So, first, each line has two half lines, like we see here. Okay? They're broken with what is called today a sesura. 
But when you look at a manuscript of Old English poetry, guess what? You don't see it like this. It looks like, this isn't even a good example. Well, just take any column in your book. It looks like that. It just looks like prose. It's just written all out. You don't have line divisions or anything like that. It's just written. <coughs> okay. We'll talk about um, how we know there are half lines, etc. later. Each line has four stressed syllables. Now, there's more than four syllables. Method Makta under Mogiba. Method S3, Makta 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's 10 syllables there. But only four of them are accented. Okay? Or stressed. Each half line has two stressed syllables. So there's got to be two stressed syllables in the first half, and there's got to be two stressed syllables in the second half. How do you know which one's which? The first three stressed syllables may alliterate. That is, the two in the first half line and the first one in the second half line may alliterate. The fourth stressed syllable, never. With a few exceptions. Why? Why don't they stress that fourth? Uh, why don't they alliterate that fourth stress syllable? We have no idea. There's nothing that says, you know, it's like uh, 666 and you don't know, pair of vowels. Just no idea. Okay? The first stress syllable in the second half line determines the alliteration for the entire line. Well, who in his ale-saturated brain came up with that rule? Why not make it the first stress syllable in the first half line determines the alliteration? Because that means we got to go here to find it as a reader. But imagine you're the creator. That means before you even start, you have to know what you're going to stress or emphasize in the second half of the line. Now you know why Cadman got up and left? <laughs> this is not easy, right? This is not E.E. E. Cummings. E.E. E. Cummings. <laughs> and it's there. Right? <laughs> One stress syllable in the first half line has got to alliterate with the first stress syllable in the second half line. That is, two of the stress syllables have to alliterate. Okay? Doesn't have to be the first one. Doesn't have to be the second one. It could be both stress syllables alliterate with the third stress. Okay. Um, and then all initial vowels alliterate. Eight ja R. This one doesn't alliterate. Why? It's not stressed. I mean, yes, it does alliterate, but it's not stressed. That's a prefix. Prefixes, generally, you don't put stress on them. Okay? This is the fourth stress syllable. So, each of the R on Stalva. Okay? Where, Wulgu, Wundra, Yavai. Mekur, Makta, Modlifam. That's the fourth stress syllable. Now, you can also have what's called resolve stress, but we won't go into that. Where you have two kind of minor stresses become a major stress. You can, you can apply these rules to all 3,182 lines of Bacon and people have they've scanned the entire poem. Okay? That's how we know this is true. This applies. Okay? B gets up and leaves because he doesn't know how to do uh, Cabin gets up and leaves because he doesn't know how to do this. And six hours later, he doesn't know how to do this. Here's the real importance of this. I said, you know, Cadman's the first English poet. What else? He's the first poet in a vernacular language. That is, an everyday, ordinary language that normal people speak. Whether it's Old English, Old Saxon, Gothic, Old French, Old Spanish, Old Italian, etc. He's the first one to take the native literary traditions of that language and put it to quote-unquote Christian purposes. 
Because all the poems he composes, according to Bede, they're all Christian stuff. It's primarily material from the Old Testament. According to Bede, he goes on and he tells the story of the parting of the Red Sea and the departure of the Israelites from Egypt. He tells the story of Daniel in the lion's den and the three youths in the fiery furnace. Okay? Bede gives us all that. Now we have a manuscript that in the 19th century was called the Cadman Manuscript because it has poems that fit perfectly Bede's description of what Cadman composed. 19th century, it was thought, this is the Cadman Manuscript. Not written by Cadman, but poems by Cadman. No scholars today think that Cadman wrote all these because there are differences in style and such between these and Cadman's and um, things like that. Okay, we will stop there since I don't write on time. And Tuesday, uh, I believe we have The Wanderer.